Hello everyone. Today I will be talking to you about revving monotonicity under misspecified bidders. I'm Makis and this is joint work with Odyssey Astrosis and Robert Kleinberg. A well-studied problem in mechanism design is that of designing a revving maximizing auction. In particular, in a single parameter environment, Meyerson has given us an elegant characterization of that optimal auction. But a crucial assumption that it makes is that the auction designer has uh, accurate distributional information about where the bidder's valuations are coming from. And uh, this is not always true. And as Robert Wilson put it, if we want theory to approximate uh, reality, then we need to weaken assumptions like that. And there has been work, uh, particularly in the CS community along these lines, specifically with prior free uh, mechanism design and uh, prior independent mechanism design. Uh, in the latter case, uh, we assume there is a prior, but we, we, do, we do not know, but we're learning it from samples. In this work, uh, we concern ourselves with the, questions of, with the question of what if we have designed an auction under the wrong distributional assumptions? Can we still get some meaningful guarantees on its performance? Specifically, the, uh, the setting which we concern ourselves with is a Bayesian single parameter mechanism design setting with an added distinction between two kinds of bidders, green and red bidders. For the green bidders, the auction designer has complete and accurate information about their distributions. For the red bidders, the uh, designer has their own uh, distributions for their valuations. Uh, now, the, the colors of the bidders are not revealed to the mechanism, actually, so, and the designer doesn't know it. So what happens is the designer is assuming that the value VI of its bidder is coming from a distribution FI, when in reality, this is only true for the green bidders. The red bidders, for the red bidders, their values VI are sampled from FI prime, which is some unknown distribution. Now, ideally, we would like to compare the revenue of that auction with an auction that is designed under the correct assumptions. But those two revenues can be too far apart to compare. A more sensible benchmark would be to compare the revenue of our auction to the revenue of an optimal auction run only on the green bidders for which we have accurate distributional information. And our hope is that uh, the existence of these extra red bidders does not hurt the revenue. In fact, they can even act as competition and increase the total revenue. So what we'll do in this work is try to characterize the setting for which this actually holds. Let me uh, go through a quick mechanism design refresher. So as usual, we uh, assume a sealed bid auction format where each bidder I submits a bid BI. There is a set I of uh, subsets of the bidders, which is called feasibility constraints, and tells us which subsets of the bidders can be uh, declared winners. A mechanism is a pair uh, of two functions, X and P. Uh, both of them take as input the bids of all the bidders, and the allocation function X outputs a set of winners, and the payment function outputs a vector of how much its bidder has to pay. Sometimes we will put a subscript to the mechanism to denote that it was designed under, under certain distributional assumptions. The bidders are, as usual, selfish agents which are trying to maximize their utility, which is shown on the screen. A mechanism is truthful if it's dominant strategy for every, for every player to bid their true valuation. And a classic result of Meyerson is that if an allocation rule X is monotone on its coordinate, monotone non-decreasing, uh, then there exists a payment function that makes the, um, the mechanism truthful. And the payment of bidder i, uh, in this case, is easy to, to describe. It's called the critical bid of the bidder. And it is the minimum bid that they have to submit uh, in order to still be a winner if we fix the bid of everyone else. Now, I talked about maximizing the expected revenue, which is defined as the expected sum of the payments that all the bidders make to the mechanism. Uh, Meyerson's lemma is a very important tool for uh, solving this problem of uh, revenue maximization, which expresses the expected payment of its bidder i with, uh, with their expected virtual valuation, which is uh, this function of bi, uh, this function phi i of bi, which I described here. If the distributions fi have the, uh, are such 
that f phi i so uh, phi i is uh, one of the non decreasing, then we call those distributions regular. And for the remaining of the stock, we will concern ourselves only with regular distributions. And just keep in mind that the general case can also be handled by standard ironing techniques. Uh, in the case of regular distributions, uh, Martian's lemma allows us now to reduce the problem of maximizing expected revenue to that of maximizing expected virtual welfare. And uh, the optimal mechanism is easy to describe, which we will call Meyer opt. Uh, so its bidder submits uh, their valuation as their bid. Uh, the, mechan the, the mechanism applies the function phi i to the respective bid bi and chooses a set of winners, uh, a set which maximizes the total virtual uh, value of that set, and then charges its bidder in that set their critical bid. Now, an important thing to notice here that we will use later is that uh, by definition of the phi i's, they, uh, this inequality holds that they are always less than or equal to their argument, or equivalently, that z is less than or equal to phi inverse of z. Just keep that in mind, we will use it later. Now, at this point, I will introduce a combinatorial structure called the matroid, uh, which we'll see shortly why this is useful. So let's define first a set system, which is uh, essentially a collection I of subsets of a ground set. Those subsets are called independent sets. Uh, further, there are two properties that are of interest here. Property I1 says that if I have a set B, which is independent, then every subset of B should also be independent. And property two says that if I have two independent sets, one of which is strictly greater than the other, then there is always an element that I can take from the bigger element and move it to the smaller one such that the smaller one remains independent after the addition. If a set system satisfies I1, it's called a downward closed set system. If it satisfies both properties, it's called a matroid. Now, matroids are important because uh, most commonly, uh, the feasibility sets of auctions actually satisfies those properties and are matroids. Let me give you examples of some common matroids. One of them is the uniform rank K matroid, for which the set I uh, um, contains all the subsets of the ground set, which have up to K elements. For example, a single item auction uh, is a, it has a feasibility constraint, which is a uniform rank one uh, matroid. Another type of matroid is, are, uh, is graphic matroid, which is given a graph G, we let the edges of that graph be the ground set and define the set of uh, independent uh, subsets to be the collection of all subsets of edges, which form a cyclic subgraph of uh, G. In other words, they are forests of G. And if you're not familiar with matroids, you can be thinking of graphic matroids for the remainder of the talk, and uh, it should be fine. Now let's go back to the setting with uh, misspecified bidders. And let's start with a warm-up uh, warm example of the single item auction. So we're selling an item, and uh, we are designing the auction assuming that everyone samples their valuation VI from the distribution FI, but in reality the red bidders uh, sampled their valuations from uh, distributions FJ prime, which we don't know at all. And uh, so the expression on the left here is the expected revenue that we will actually get when we run this uh, mechanism designed under the wrong assumptions on the green and red bidders. And on the right, we have our benchmark, which is the expected revenue uh, when we run the optimal mechanism on the green bidders alone. And without loss of generality, we can simplify things and just concern ourselves with uh, the expected revenue when uh, the red bidders has, uh, submit deterministic bids because we're looking at the worst case over all FJ primes. So let me try to compare those two, uh, those two quantities. And to do that, let me introduce some useful notation. Let phi G star be the positive part of the maximum green virtual valuation. Positive part means that if it's negative, we just replace it with zero. And phi star to be the positive part of the second highest virtual value overall, including both green and red bidders. Those two are random variables. They depend on the specific samples that the bidders got. Uh, and now I want to express the expected revenue of the mechanism I designed. So the first step is to separate this revenue from the revenue coming from the green bidders and the one coming from the red bidders. For the first part, I can express it using Meyerson's lemma 
with the virtual value of the maximum green uh, player. And I can do that because the green players actually behave as expected and they sample their values from the respective distributions. So that's the reason I can apply Martian's lab. Now, to bound the expected revenue coming from the red beaters, uh, I provide the following argument. So suppose a red beater uh, wins, what do they pay? What is the minimum uh, bid they have to submit in order to still be a winner? So their bid would have to create uh, a virtual value that is at least phi star. So their payments would be phi to the minus one of R of phi star. Now recall that we proved this inequality for the fee inverse, which I can apply here and lower down the price that uh, the red bidder paid by phi star. And further, I can notice that if the, uh, the winner is red, I can further say that phi star is greater than or equal to the greatest uh, a green virtual valuation, and further lower bound PR by phi z star. So now in that case, I have managed to lower bound the second part with this expression, an expression that includes phi z star. And then if I add them back together, I get an expression that involves only phi z star and no indicator. And then I can use uh, Myerson's lemma again to express that virtual valuation with uh, as the revenue of an auction run on the green beaters alone. So that proves that the uh, expected revenue of the auction I run under the wrong assumption is greater than or equal to, the, to my benchmark. And uh, here, here is a formal definition of what I've proved, which I call revenue monotonicity under misspecified beaters. So a mechanism A is RMMB. If uh, the following inequality holds for any distributions, uh, any uh, partition of the bidders in the green and red, and any specified bids of the red bidders. So what we just proved is that the uh, Meyerson's uh, optimal mechanism is actually our MMB. So let's try to generalize and see if that holds, even uh, when the uh, feasibility constraints are general matroids, not just uniform rank one matroids. And in fact, we proved that it holds. So if the feasibility constraints form a matroid, then Martian's optimal mechanism is RMMB. And I will provide a proof for the graphic matroids only, but uh, it generalizes easily to general matroids. So in that case, I have a graph. The edges of the graph are the bidders. Some of them are green, some of them are red. And what happens is that they sample their values. Uh, suppose that they have sampled their values and I have some concrete values for them. They submit them to the mechanism. The mechanism applies uh, the functions phi uh, i to compute the virtual valuations, and it uses that as, weight, as weights for the edges, and now computes an allocation that uh, maximizes the virtual uh, welfare. So there are two mechanisms which uh, we're interested in here. On the left is a mechanism which I call x comma p, which is the one running on all uh, bidders, and is trying to uh, uh, and it's trying to, 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 to compute a subset of the bidders that maximize their virtual welfare. And the mechanism on the right, which I call X prime P prime, which does the same, but only on the green bidders. And this is uh, two examples of uh, solutions uh, of uh, sets of winners on, uh, uh, on the same set of valuations. So I want to show that the revenue on the left mechanism is at least the revenue of the right mechanism on expectation. So the, I do the same trick as before. So I express the expected revenue, which is the sum of the payments of that solution, as the payment coming from the green beaters, the green edges, and the payments coming from the red edges. For the first part, I again use Myerson's lemma to, uh, to, to express it as a virtual valuation. And for the second part, I need to lower bound it. And to do that, uh, I will try the following trick. I will try adding each of the red uh, edges on the bottom right, to the graph on the bottom right here. And during that process of updating the solution on the right to the solution on the left, I will also uh, get lower bounds on the price paid. So in order to do that, let me quickly remind you a fact about maximum spanning trees and which generalizes to make trades easily, is that if I have a graph and I compute its maximum spanning tree, which is shown here on the right, but then I realized that the, I forgot about an edge of that graph. So that edge was in the graph, but I, I did not consider it when I was computing the maximum spanning tree. Now, instead of computing the maximum spanning tree from scratch, I can just add this edge to the tree I had, which will create a cycle, and I can just remove the minimum edge of that cycle. This will create a new minimum span, maximum spanning tree uh, for the new graph. 
So this is the trick we can, which I can apply to get from one solution, the green only solution, to the green plus red solution, which I do as follows. I start adding the red edges in an arbitrary order. So let's say, for example, that I add this edge first, phi, uh, which has virtual value phi r. And uh, this created a cycle. And the minimum edge on that cycle has uh, the, the, the edge of minimum valuation has uh, virtual valuation phi g. And I remove that. And at this point, I know that uh, I can express the payment that uh, the red bidder made as a function of uh, phi of g. Because if uh, the red bidder ever submitted a bid uh, that made his uh, virtual valuation less than phi g, then he would lose the option. So that red bidder has to pay at least phi r to the minus one of phi g. And using a regular uh, uh, inequality, we can just lower bound it by phi g. Now I continue adding edges. Uh, the next red edge doesn't create any cycle. So at that point, I cannot say anything better than uh, the fact that uh, the, 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 this red bidder paid at least zero. And then I add the final edge in my example, which also creates a cycle. There is a green edge on that cycle with a minimum virtual value. And I again can uh, bound the payment that this new red bidder made by this uh, virtual value of the green bidder. So essentially now recall that I had split the revenue into two parts, the revenue coming from the green and from the red. And for the red bidders, I managed to lower bound that revenue by a virtual uh, welfare on the dotted green uh, edges, which together with the solid green edges, they recreate the solution that I had on the bottom right in the, uh, in the previous slide, which is the total virtual valuation of the solution, including only the green bidders. And by Martian's lemma, I can express this as the revenue of a mechanism run only on the green bidders which concludes the proof uh, of the revenue monotonicity. The last line is exactly the revenue monotonicity property that I wanted to show. And notice that I used the, the, uh, the fact that uh, the feasibility constraint is a matroid in the, in the trick I did with the maximum spanning trees of, uh, as, uh, of saying that the minimum edge on a cycle is uh, never on the optimal solution. This is a fact that generalizes to all matroids. Let's see now what happens when the feasibility constraints do not form a matroid. Here we claim that the revenue monotonicity theorem is not true. And to see that, consider the following example with three bidders. The gray ellipses on the screen indicate the possible sets of winning bidders. And notice that this is not a matroid because the second property of the matroids is violated. Specifically, if I have the big set containing the two red bidders and the small set containing just the green bidder, there is no element that I can trans transfer from the big set to the small set, such that the small set with the added element remains a feasible winning set. And now, in this environment, uh, let the green bidder have a deterministic value equal to 1, and let the red bidders advertise that their values are samples from a distribution with the uh, CDF that is showing on the screen uh, for some constant k. And, but in reality, the red bidders are submitting a bid that is equal to phi to the minus one of one, which is the value slightly bigger than one for large enough k. Now let's see what happens when we run this uh, Myerson's optimal mechanism on this setting. If we run it on just a green bidder alone, the green bidder always has the deterministic value of 1, which we, the designers, know. So in order to maximize our revenue, we will always charge them 1. And that's our expected revenue. Now, what happens when we run the auction to the set of all bidders? Recall that we define the red bidders to be giving a deterministic bid that will translate into a virtual value of 1. So in that case, everyone has virtual value 1. And the optimal winning set is the one containing the two red bidders but how much are each one of them paying? So consider one of the red bidders. If they bid anything that gives them a virtual value greater than zero, then they will still be included in the optimal solution. Therefore, the uh, critical bid uh, is phi to the minus one of zero, which for this case is sli something slightly bigger than zero. And so the total revenue is two over k minus two, which uh, tends to zero as k goes to infinity, and it's less than one, the revenue we got when we were selling only to c. So our revenue actually got worse when we added the red bidders.
And notice here that there is, uh, if this was actually a matroid, then by the second property, it would mean that there must have existed a set like the dotted set, dotted wing set that I have on the screen. And in that case, the red bidder on the bottom would have to compete with a red winning set. And they would have to pay something that would make their, uh, their, their critical bid would have to be something that makes their virtual value something at least one. This means that we would pay phi to the minus one of one, which, if you recall, is something greater than or equal to one. And this has already recovered the revenue from the one bidder. So essentially, in the case of the matroid, there is a nice competition between the green and the red bidders. And we can always charge a red bidder's payment to a green bidder's payment. In the non-matroid case, this we cannot always guarantee. There is a fake competition between the red bidders, which ends up uh, with a, uh, in a situation where both of them are paying far less than they should. In fact, we can prove that in any downward closed feasibility uh, system, that uh, there is not a matroid, we can find a very similar structure to this one and prove that the revenue monotonicity uh, theorem does not hold. So combining with the previous theorem we saw, we have the following characterization that for downward closed feasibility constraint systems, Martian's optimal mechanism is revenue monotone under the specified bidders if and only if M is a matroid. To conclude, we presented a mechanism design model for misspecified bidders. We uh, proposed a notion of revenue monotonicity on that model, and we characterized the feasibility constraints for which Martian's optimal mechanism is revenue monotone. Now, there are several, several open questions here. Recall that in the, uh, towards the end, we proved that in non-matroid systems, the revenue on just the green bidders can be greater than the expected revenue on both the green and the red, which means that the ratio I have on the screen here can be greater than one, even though for matroids, this was always less than or equal to one. We saw a specific example where this ratio was tending to infinity for a three element non-matroid system. But can we prove that this is true for every non-matroid system, that it will always go to infinity? The proof we have does not entail this. And as a further question, can we design other mechanisms, uh, not necessarily me Martian's optimal mechanism, that can achieve a bounded uh, ratio alpha under non-matroid feasibility constraints? For example, intuitively, one might think that uh, randomly ignoring players can help. And in fact, in some cases can. So that's it. Thank you for your attention.